Good evening to our school board, Don Williams. To our faculty and staff of Gainesville City Schools represented here tonight, and our parents, our hardworking parents. And good evening to our community partners and other leaders from our community. Gainesville High School is extremely honored to pay tribute to one of the greatest heroes and champions of our time. A hero and a champion with civil rights, equality, social justice, peace, and freedom, Congressman John Robert Lewis. Our troop will proceed with the presentation of our nation's colors by Gainesville High School in ROTC Color Guard and the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by words of expression from JHS Senior Mr. Don Angelo Marshall and a moment of silence. And we will conclude our tribute with a song tribute from JHS Senior Ms. Allison Bennett. We are very appreciative to our school board and Dr. Williams for this opportunity. And now we invite everyone to please stand for the presentation of our nation's colors. Oh, word, Lord. Lord. Good evening, I'm Dr. Angela Marshall. I'll be giving a speech today. On this earth, you have many different types of people. You can describe them in your basic adjectives good, bad, or neutral. You can go further on and describe people with basic terminology that is slightly more famous. Words like great or horrible. However, the most impactful people on this planet cannot be constrained in such simple terms. The fact they have been they encounter cannot be described as few simple adjectives from the dictionary. These remarkable people represent the apex of human emotion, desire, passion, and bravery. United States Congressman John Ralph Lewis is more than just an extraordinary figure. He is the epitome of ambition with a natural human desire to make the world a better place, not just for himself, but for the many generations after. He was a civil rights leader who was arrested more than 40 times while fighting for the voting rights for black Americans. The courage he portrayed can never be described in this in order. Even my short speech that you will see to right now comes nowhere close to the impact he has left on me, noticed within all the communities of Angel Hawk County. The words I express today are incomparable to the Congressman John Lewis to the impact on the state of Georgia, the United States of America, and the world as a whole. We are currently in tough times. Racial injustices are still prevalent, and many people are still fighting against racial discrimination in this country. John Lewis was an activist that ignited the interplay with many other activists. He sparked an interest in the passion that created a drive for many people to the position that will better the lives of millions. Those boys and girls will hopefully remember his day for years to come. However, everything that we fight for now isn't necessarily for our own benefit, but for theirs. John Lewis, until his very last moment on this earth, was making this world a better place by supporting those who wanted to see change. This concept should be kept with everyone listening to my message today. 
Don't attempt to only make change for yourself, but make change for the people you might not be able to do for themselves. Do for your children, do for their children, and do for the innocent souls who have lost their lives through the injustices so they'll never happen again. When John Lewis believed that he would lose his life after getting beat in the march crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge, he reserved on and kept continuing to fight for he believed it. This one exponential man triggered a butterfly effect into the minds of the younger generations. He was the beacon of hope into the dark world and a catalyst for change. In closing, I encourage us all to be like Congressman John Lewis. Act selflessly, live and move with passion and desire, and become someone who impacts people in such a way that can't be explained with simple words. May he rest in peace. I now ask everyone to join me in a moment of silence for the next three seconds in honor of Congressman John Lewis. Good evening. My name is Allison Vandiver. I'm a senior at Gainesville High School, and I will be singing America is Beautiful in honor of Congressman John Lewis. America is beautiful, more spacious skies. For amber waves of rain, for purple mountain majesties of the mountain plain, America, America, God shed His grace on thee. We brother from sea to shining sea. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Cromwell. Appreciate it. Um, say anything you want to add, Mr. Stewart. And y'all make sure your microphone's on. Uh, next item on the agenda are citizen comments. We, have, uh, we did not have any of the news today uh, to the virtual link. Okay. Uh, they have a motion on the job, adoption of the agenda. Motion to adopt on the four, five, and six. Second. Got a motion by Mr. Smith, second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor? Dr. Lewis? Yeah, first of all, uh, good to be back in a facility that we've not seen in quite some time. Also, uh, to our high school students, good to see y'all again in performing. So thank you, Ms. Danford, Mr. Marshall, Mr. Cromwell as well. Thank you all so much. Uh, before I get into the report, I'd like Ms. Sarah Bell to come forward and share uh, a little bit about uh, someone you've heard a lot about and probably haven't met face-to-face. Ms. Bell, if you would move that microphone back that other direction. Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Ms. John Wales this evening. Uh, thank you, Matt, for whatever that would be. Uh, she has been invaluable. You may remember that back in July, your group for our new health coordinator, and we certainly have enjoyed having her with us. She has a wealth of experience with school nursing and nursing in the health system. And boy, we have really um, benefited from all of that expertise as we have been implemented our protocols that work through some of our case investigations in the past month and a half, and we're just really pleased to have her with us. I wanted you to be able to put a face with the name. Thank you. Thank you. Or at least eyes with the name. Thank you. It's today was the uh, first day of school, a bit untraditional than, than non-traditional, I guess, than what we're used to seeing. 
Uh, I hope board members that you were able to make it out, whether personally with your own uh, children or at least with some of the schools last week here in the house. Um, you, you can imagine that as everybody tried to get on today, uh, Ms. Jones sent out a tweet earlier for people to reply with their back to school pictures and all of that. And you know, some kids were dressed up just as they would have been on the regular first day of school. I would have been in the buildings. Others had their legs propped up next to the computer with pajamas. Uh, my kids did not enjoy me waking them up early today so we can get a family picture of the first day of school. They've got a few days to sleep, that, sleep it out. Uh, one thing that I did want to bring to your attention to the superintendent's report is the participation that we had during open house. And these numbers, uh, I cannot say with 100% certainty that they are accurate because the enrollment constantly changes. Uh, what I can say though is that we had a great turnout, great participation across the board. Uh, most of our schools were over 90%, in some cases, well above 90% participation. Uh, some families did not come, but they got rescheduled. Others that, that were not scheduled originally showed up later. Uh, you can imagine uh, to, when you look at the middle school, uh, over 1,300 of the 1,400 plus students that are participating face to face showed up over those five days. Uh, that's, a, that's a great, great turnout. Even the high school, that sometimes you see the numbers a little lower, we're still close to 70%. And that number indicates families. So if a family has more than one child at the high school, they're only counting one time in that 12 4 So we know that number is even higher than that. The feedback we received was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, unfortunately, it means that in the future we may have to do something similar because I think a lot of the families enjoyed that one-on-one -on -one time, 20 to 30 minutes with their child's teacher before the school year started. Uh, great, great job by our teachers, by other staff members who were just so accommodated to our families and understanding. But one of the things that we charge our employees with is that during these three weeks, the first thing we have to do is build relationships. And I think we went a long way with that last week. And over these next few weeks, to continue to set expectations, identify learning gaps, uh, but also more need to get us educated. Uh, so that's the open house participation. We were very pleased. Also, I'd like to bring your attention to the virtual academy numbers. Uh, Ms. Hobson's here with us. And, uh, she's overseeing the work and serving in many, many, many roles, I think is an understatement right now uh, with the Virtual Academy. Uh, Dr. Chad Crumley is leading the elementary efforts, Ms. Tisha Sargent is leading the middle school efforts, and Dr. Paige Galt uh, is leading the high school efforts. The one thing that I would like to point out during all of this is we knew that we extended that initial window from July 15th through the 31st. Uh, some families or some students are being waitlisted right now as we uh, look at solutions uh, to better serve our families. Uh, this gives you an idea of the work done just in the last six weeks. It typically takes about a month or excuse me, a year and a half uh, or longer to get a virtual school up and running. And so to be able to do it in such a short turnaround, we know that there will be kinks that we still got to work out. Uh, we're, we're well aware of that, uh, but also we'll be very uh, pleased with the, just the graciousness from our families understanding that we'll get there. And so you can see those numbers across each grade level and also across each school. Uh, we did have to pull, I believe it was 16 teachers from elementary, um, or maybe 16 or 17 teachers from elementary and shift them to a virtual environment. Uh, so that did require some homeroom changes. Fortunately, they were all uh, worked out before uh, we started with the house. So there may still be some changes down the road. Uh, you can see the overall numbers there and the grade levels uh, that, that our students are being pulled from. Then at the bottom, just a COVID impact on employees. We started back uh, with all employees on the 29th. And since that time, we did collect information, collect information, continue to do so uh, with some of our data that we have. Uh, this number is ever changing because the, the more uh, we are around people, the more we are impacted by these numbers. So this is not necessarily a snapshot uh, as far as a week at a time, but it is the data since July 1st. You can see that as a whole, uh, we did, we've had symptomatic employees, uh, none are currently in isolation or quarantine. We've had uh, 31 COVID positive contact, uh, six of which are still in isolation or quarantine, in that case would be quarantine. And then we've had 19 COVID positives, two of which are still in isolation. So we know that as, that as we continue to return to a face-to-face -face setting, a lot of this goes back to balancing what we're doing professionally versus personally and what our life looks like inside and outside of the school. So these numbers continue to get better and better, and we're, we're glad to see that. One thing we are monitoring, and we will be providing more uh, health guidance before we return face-to-face, 
uh, and that is looking at how many symptomatic uh, situations turn into a positive. Um, you're, you're seeing different research on that. We just want to monitor it from our standpoint so that our health guidance can be as accurate as possible. Uh, we also uh, have a you know, bond rating information here related to uh, where we are with our 83. Somebody called my accident, and I just got to the phone to make sure everything was okay. What did that phone ring a minute ago? This phone rang a minute ago that it was the person's name in the pocket. They were probably calling to see if everything was okay. That's all I was going to say. As far as I know, everything's okay. We are being live streamed, so unless we know differently. Thank you for checking on us. <laughs> Uh, so on the bond rating, $83 million uh, going to market here in the next few days. So we do have a meeting called for Wednesday, August 19th at 8 a.m. Uh, to approve the supplement bond resolution to any subsequent action to go with that. But the big part that I just really want to brag on uh, Ms. Bethel and her team and your leadership board as a district is we, for the first time, have received a bond rating from Moody's Investor Service. And uh, Mr. Nemick, if you would pull up that other attachment. We received the designation, and this, this uh, report here is public on, on the uh, assembly website, uh, but this is a summary of the issuance. And so for us, when you have a rating in the past of an A+, plus, that is a strong rating, but now we have jumped up to a double A2. Uh, so we, with Moody's, uh, that means we will be able to save money on an investment uh, as far as interest is concerned but also over the life of that bond, we'll be able to save a good bit of money, uh, estimating right now around $750,000 because of the increased rating that goes with bond. So if you want to dig into that, uh, Moody's rating a little bit more, it gives you an idea of where we are. The only uh, level above us in the double A's and double A plus, and then you get to triple A. So we're very excited about uh, where we are with our um, reserves, where we are with our financial outlook, and Moody's has rated us at that level, which will help us down the road. Uh, as we move forward. So, Mr. Chair, that is my report. Any questions? Any questions? Sam? Two things. Uh, one, might uh, Ms. Bethel share this uh, long report with our, with the City Finance Office, uh, City Council and City Finance Office. It's good news and it would be good to share. We work closely with them uh, in terms of finance matters. Uh, secondly, uh, back to the virtual academy. Uh, can you tell me again if I missed this? Why why is there a wait list? So the reason we put a wait list on it is when we the initial numbers came in, we didn't put a cap of what a class size would be for our teachers. And so as people continue to come, what we're running into is that we don't want an elementary teacher with third grade having 60 kids in the classroom. And so what we're trying to do is find out if the kids that initially signed up, first of all, are they continuing face-to-face, -face, some of which are coming off the list, and then the students on the wait list are being put on. And so it's a way for us to kind of slow down that process to not uh, overwhelm our teachers, but to also vet the choices that our families are making. For those who are on the wait list, are these are city residents? Yes. Uh, or did, did we... There, there may be some uh, non-resident tuition uh, students on there, but I've not checked the list recently to, to confirm that. Okay. For, for those who have students on the wait list, do they know the process and the review that is being done in order to shorten the wait time or give them give them uh, options? Ms. Hobson, would you like to answer that? <clears throat> We're working as fast as we can with the staff that we have in order to be able to serve those who responded prior to the deadline and get, and get all of those folks taken care of. And then we're slowly making our way now to the process of looking at the wait list, evaluating. Um, I think the last check I had, the wait list was up around 75 or 80. And so we've got to evaluate how we will make a determination of which um, individuals we'll be able to place. As Dr. Williams said, part of that is looking at class size and, and how much staffing we have available. And all of those that are on the wait list signed up after the deadline of July 31st. That's correct. So if they met the deadline, they are not on the wait list. 
It's just been those since that time who either decided they want to go uh, with the Gainesville Virtual Academy uh, or uh, they were unaware of the Virtual Academy. Okay. Potentially, if there, there, is there a wait list going in the other direction? People there, who maybe were virtual but want to come back in person? Smaller, but yes. And those, um, those that have asked, now that we said, once you commit, we're asking you to commit for a semester. If we are receiving those requests to return to face-to-face, -face, they will go through a re review with the, the cabinet and determine which of those um, reasons make sense to go ahead and return those folks to face-to-face -face instruction. And again, as we do that, we will probably have some room to um, shift some folks in. We meet tomorrow with the cabinet. Mm -hmm. So don't know about tomorrow evening the first thing we do. Yeah. And we have a, let me clarify because of a question I got today. Uh, we haven't differentiated uh, wait list students in uh, city residents and out of city residents. No, not that I'm aware of. Either. No, and to be honest, um, you know, we're, we're taking all of those requests as they come to us. Um, as far as a proof of residency, or we have not yet completed a proof of residency for any of our students, quite frankly, not just through the virtual academy, but across the board. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Williams? Well, since Ms. Steffel did such a good, great job getting our bond up, ready to upgrade, I'm going to relieve her of her duty of giving us the donation report. I think we can all read. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll read and contact her at your leisure. Uh, I also would like to take the opportunity to apologize to Lieutenant Boudreaux. Uh, normally, we do allow the cadets to introduce themselves and tell us about the future plans, but uh, it's a rookie mistake. I'll take the blame on that. So good to go. All right, thank you. Again, I hope they get to come back and uh, present the cover. We'll be back. All right, thank you. Uh, Coach Linden, you're up next to tell us about the uh, safety protocols for our, all of our sports, but especially our fall sports. As Ms. Lindsay comes up, one thing that we, we've spoken about with each of you as well is uh, our student athletes have been back on campus this June 8th. And so they have been some of our uh, opportunities to test some of our safety protocols and guidelines and procedures. And they've been great with us, and they've also been patient with us as well. And so just big kudos to them, because I know they're all excited to be back. Uh, but also, they, they're going to have the opportunity to help lead uh, some of our schools uh, when we do get to come back face-to-face, -face, if they've been through uh, what the expectation is going to be for kids. Thank you for the opportunity to come speak today. You know, Got to drink a little leeway out of down my notes here to make sure I didn't forget anything because we, we, there's a lot that's happened this summer. As you know, when school was shut down on March 13th, our student athletes were not able to complete their 2021 spring season. We were not able to play games, practice, or train in the weight room. And I want to tell you how proud I was of our coaches and athletes during this time frame. Our coaches held weekly Zoom meetings with their teams simply just to check in and make sure everyone was doing all right. And I wouldn't be surprised if those Zoom meetings had higher participation rates than our teachers did. It's probably, it would probably have meant more to those coaches than it did to the athletes, as our coaches truly missed being with our athletes on a daily basis. It wasn't until June 8th that we were allowed to get back with our athletes. At that time, we started with a more stringent plan than the guidelines were given to us by the GHSA. We worked with athletes in groups of a coach and nine. We tip checked and wellness checked. Two weeks later, we were able to expand the group to groups of 20 while continuing with the 10th and wellness checks. This carried through the month of June. Beginning after dead week, we were able to expand our groups to 20, of 20 to groups of 50. This was done by combining two groups of 20 while allowing anyone that had not shown up to date to join that group. Beginning on July 27th, football began combining everyone together while all of the sports were able to already do so because of the groups of 50. The Valentine's Center gets sanitized after every group, as well as throughout the entire time. Our coaches have been diligent about sanitizing anything that was touched by a player before and after to ensure no contamination. Also on July 27th, we put in place a mandatory mask policy for our coaches that required them to have a mask on at all times, indoors, outdoors, practice, and competitions. 
Up until the 27th, no locker room spaces had been used uh, for, for any group. On the 27th, football created a social distance locker room in the alumni gym that allowed each athlete state, athlete station that would have a 10 foot circumference with them. Although I feel like our coaches have done an amazing job uh, creating the safest environment possible, we have certainly had our bumps along the way, which has turned into learning experiences for us all. As of today, our coaches are always wearing masks. masks. Our athletes are expected to wear them at all times unless they are participating in practice or competition. Last week, we began our first competitions for volleyball across cross country, and I'm happy to report that those events went off without a hitch. But between those two groups, they picked up 13, 13 wins last week, including Don Angel and Marshall, who took first place at the Lanier Christian Invitational. The GHSA has made a decision to push both competition cheerleading and one act play until later this school year. Decisions made by other school systems has forced us to be on the lookout for a couple of football games, which we expect to clear up very shortly. Other than that, we are all set to move forward with the 2020 fall season. As you all know, today was the first day of school for Gainesville City Schools, where we all started with remote instruction. Today, we all adjust our practice schedules for athletics, the arts, and ROTC. In an attempt to ensure that those programs would continue to thrive during this time, we have given those groups the opportunity to bring a controlled number of students in the morning for those coaches and teachers to be able to work with to ensure that they are prepared. We met with the teachers and coaches in football, softball, volleyball, band, ROTC, cheerleading, chorus, and drama to get their feedback on their desire to be able to work with their students in the morning. All of them jumped on the opportunity. Most of those groups are bringing their students from 8 to, 8 to 10 a.m. each day and then sending them home in time to do their remote instruction lab meetings. While students are on campus, they are expected to follow the same COVID protocols that we've been using all summer. The football team has taken an extended approach to this. The football, uh, football players are staying on campus until 2 p.m. where they have practice in the morning, two hours of supervised learning time, eat lunch, uh, lift weights, and watch film before they are sent home for their afternoon live sessions. This allows for our football staff to ensure that our athletes are up and they're ready for school while also being uh, given an opportunity to monitor their learning. In the bigger picture, this opportunity is allowing for us to use this time to teach our students what our new home looks like. So when we do come back face to face, we'll have student leaders in the building at all levels, in all groups that understand the importance of wearing masks, social distancing, and proper hygiene to ensure that we all stay, stay safe. Right now, we're preaching to all of our athletes, now more than ever, they should be treating every opportunity to compete as being potentially their last. They all got to see firsthand what happened last spring. It is because of this that our athletes and coaches are taking this opportunity very seriously. They know they have more to lose than anyone else at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Any questions? Okay. Uh, couple of com uh, comments. Uh, of course, Lindsay, we do appreciate your uh, weekly uh, newsletter. It's quite good, quite informative, and it goes uh, far and wide. Secondly, I think I heard you say that uh, back in the summer that. Uh, the protocols that you put in place exceeded the Florida High School uh, yes, protocols? Yes, sir. Whenever, whenever we, we're just everybody's trying to get ahead of the game and figure out what they're doing so we can make sure we're ready to go. So we actually started looking at the, what the NFHS put out, and those guidelines started off with the coach in nine. When the GHSA rolled out theirs, they put the point. But we were ready to move forward with ours, and we feel like given the current time and days of absolute success. Very good. One question. Uh, I did read that uh, the Fulton County Schools have uh, pushed off their football, and there was, I believe, we had two games scheduled with the Fulton School. Uh, is not playing those two weeks an option that you all are considering? Um, no. Uh, we, our kids want to compete, so uh, our, our goal is to find uh, those two games. We've, we've got one that we've got pretty much locked on, we're still looking for one more. So okay. our, I, our plan is, is to play. Okay. My question is, I guess, is based on the, what the SEC has done in pushing back to the end of September. So uh, it, I just wanted to know if it was an option. It, it, it's obviously an option, um, but you know, it, unless we receive Different guys are our point. We won't leave it to push off three weeks. Correct. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And so, you know, right now, I think a lot of the school districts are waiting to see what happens with GHSA. If they push it further into September, or if it's a region only game that we're asked to play, um, you know, you're starting to see some of those trends. Uh, but I think you'll see games on all county schools. We still want to commit. Our kids have been working hard, uh, but also been very safe. Uh, but we also know that, you know, it doesn't take much for things to get out of hand. As we're in a new region, a new classification, how, how many are in our region? We, we make seven. Um, and work with all the Forsyth County schools. And then the good thing, you know, Forsyth County, they're, they're very committed to playing. So um, between us and them, I think we'll be okay. Uh, the situation is obviously very fluid with the GHSA and all the other school systems that are evaluating and making their decisions. So. Okay, thank you. Yep. So this is right now when it's the first football game too? As of right now, our first uh, game is uh, the 18th at Fire Branch. And then we get it over the fourth and the eleventh. Those two make up games. We're we're uh, our rescheduled game has been scheduled for the twenty fifth. Um, and then we're we've got possibilities of the fourth or whatever. Our goal is to find the fourth. We want to we want to play as soon as possible. What what we get to determine is what does a, a crowd of any look like at City Park. Um, with volleyball, with softball and with cross country, those those crowds are obviously usually family members and close friends. Uh, we also are aware with the city park, um, people line civic center, people line the fence that's around the city park. And so there's some conversations we will continue to have uh, that our kids are, are not put in a, a compromising situation. But I, I just want to tip my hat off to our student athletes. I mean, they have come in and they've uh, met every expectation. Uh, they were the first ones to wear a mask. They were the first ones to gripe about it. They were the first ones to then realize it's not too bad. Uh, but we, we all know that our goal is to get back face to face, and our kids know that they're going to have to do certain things in order to do that. Uh, you look at the monitoring that's been going on by the coaches and Mr. Lindsay and the staff. Uh, you look at the levels of engagement. The, the students have been missing that contact uh, with one another and with, with the adults. And so we're looking forward to being able to hopefully expand that and provide safe environments for our kids to return. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Coach Lindsay. Appreciate it very much. All right. Uh, Ms. Hobson, you've got the last two items on the agenda. Good evening. Uh, the first item I'm bringing to you is a proposal to purchase. 4,100 Chromebooks for pre-kindergarten through fifth grade students. Uh, we did receive three bids. The winning bid was in the amount of $1,219,200 from Sherlock Technologies. And these Chromebooks are being purchased in collaboration with our Department of Academics using consolidated funds. The bid is attached if you have any specific questions about um, the plan. And keep in mind, what we did have back in April, the purchase of 4,000 or so for our secondary students. Uh, you need to update us when we expect to see those or hope to see those. We hope to see those at the beginning of September. That's about as close as I can get to a uh, surety. <laughs> and so this will best to follow along the heels of that um, and ensure that as we continue to grow remote instruction, we will have enough devices when those come in to help out uh, from the elementary level but we also know that we need to replace those as well down the road, and this is getting us a head start on those replacements. Was there any uh, guesstimation on the arrival of this order? February. And that is? 2021, at least? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 2020. But that is not atypical from what we are seeing in the marketplace, period. If anybody, who is here or is listening has tried to go out and buy a device. I think what you're finding is um, it's, it's not unusual for them to say, we don't have any in stock. It's going to be later before we can deliver it. And in some cases, they are telling you, if you order it now, January or February. Motion to approve. Got a motion. Can I ask one quick question? So, Understanding that a lot of this money, this is all coming out of consolidated funds, and a lot of it is going for the devices, but I also saw in the quote there's some services that you know you would assume would be ongoing into the future. 
is the money that would typically go to pay for licensing and things like that, and that, that would fall within our normal technology budget on a daily basis. So. This, is, this is an initial license when you buy a Chrome book. You, it's like buying a Microsoft software license. If you were buying Microsoft, you're buying a license for the operating system software in order for that Chrome book to operate. So, yeah, right. So it's not a it's not a repeat repeating fund uh, or repeating cost. Sure thing. So I've got a motion by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Nordle, all those in favor. All right. Go Gardner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Go Gardner. Right. And so along with the work that we're doing to move to one to one, this is essentially where we're headed with the number of devices that we're purchasing. Um, we're looking at an increase in the number of devices that we have and how they're going to be used. Uh, now we will be looking at devices if they're issued to every student that we will send home with that child on a daily basis for them to carry home. Um, and we want to make sure that when those devices go home and they are used that they are safe. That we're providing the safest possible way to use them. We also want to make sure in the classroom that teachers have the management tools they need to be able to deal with having more screens in use than they may have had in the past. This particular management suite gives us those kinds of tools. It allows us to provide filtering even when a device is off campus. It also allows us to give teachers a management console so that they can see every screen while the student is in the classroom. So therefore, I bring forth for you tonight a recommendation that the board approve the purchase of the GoGuardian suite in the amount of $52,812. Any questions? You, you described, Ms. Thompson, you described uh, some kind of uh, GPS feature. Um, so the feature that would allow um, us to be able to track a device as it leaves and goes wherever um, is a little bit different technology than this. You have to actually have um, an RFID tag on a device so that you can track it. Do we, um, do we have it? We do not have those. No, we have not invested in the in the funding to do that. But what we do have is the ability with this to be able to see when that device is used on the internet. So if the device is connected to the internet, we'll be able to tell that, and we have the ability at that point to uh, render the device less useful. We can we can basically turn it turn it down so that it can't be used. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Any discussion on it? Uh, I have one. With the uh, construction at the high school underway and more is planned, can I restate uh, that it would be nice to have some options for the flag plaza? Mm -hmm. That we, uh, we actually were out there last week during an open house and looked at the area where we have some artwork and all of that where the new cafeteria media center is going to go. Uh, we want to put together a committee to look at all the pieces that are currently on campus uh, and then how we can either move them to a different location or uh, put them back on the campus when, when some of the future construction is done. So, yeah, there will definitely be an opportunity to do that. Options would be good. Thank you. Any other? Discussion time. Got a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Got a motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Got a second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor?